We are live. Andy. <laughs> yeah, you just go. Sorry. <laughs> uh, this is Literary Roadhouse. One short story once a week. I'm Andy. I'm an ace. And I'm Gerald. And as you guys just heard, Andy's back. For those who didn't listen to our episode mm-hmm. this week, Andy is a longtime friend of mine who's an avid reader of almost exclusively fantasy and sci-fi, very pulpy genre fiction. I'm not knocking that. It's a lot of fun. I read it too. But he's been knocking literary fiction, so we're going to try to make him a convert. Let's see if we can convince him. So, Andy, you picked uh, this week's story blindly, which is how we always do it. So what did we read? So we read uh, Chaunt by Joy Williams. Oh, we did. So what happens in Chaunt? Well, let me tell you what happens in Chaunt. (laughs) Several things. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Um, All right. So this this person who we eventually find out is named Jane Click is in some sort of what seems like a retirement home or similar facsimile after her son and his the, her son's friend were killed in a car accident. There she meets a friendly jester named Theodore. <laughs> who invites her to drive down to the place her son and his friend were visiting frequently before they were killed, which is where things that may or may not be animals are in an abandoned town named Chaunt. And she doesn't go. And then eventually she devolves into isolation and despair. And it is assumed she dies. Oh, Yeah, that's about right. There's a little bit in there before of other people saying crazy shit. Uh, yeah. Um, we also find out <laughs> way more than we need to know about how this man feels about elk in his cooler. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. And on the journey of nothing happening on the surface, as we were talking about in the pre-show, there's a lot that's happening beneath the surface. So let's just do... So level. much. So mm. much. So let's just yeah. do top level. So how did you guys feel about the story? Let's start with Gerald. Um, <clears throat> I I really enjoyed it. Um, apart from the fact it made me feel stupid, because there is so much to this story, and and I was saying in the pre-show that that even after I I'd, I'd sort of come up with my conclusions and my thoughts about it, when I checked some analysis and and some other comments, I didn't understand what the analysis was. So I, it's it's there is so much if, if we talk about the the. Uh, the iceberg thing, you know, there, there's a there's a little story, there's a tiny little bit of story, which which is interesting because she writes really well. I love her descriptions and, and, and analogies and that sort of stuff. So the, the the above the surface bit, but there's a massive ton of stuff under the surface, and and the further you go down, you realize there's more to see. So um, yeah, it's it's a challenging and interesting story, and and I enjoyed it. Yeah. Okay, Andy. Well, so I appreciated how funny it was, <laughs> which I did not think it was going to be, even while I was reading it, past several jokes. Um, <laughs> like, oh, wow, this is a really funny story about these dead kids and this lady who lives alone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, speaking to, so it is, it has its moments of funny. And also, like, she doesn't always explain where the joke is or her reference, but, like, things like the youth that come in um, that are possibly criminals, but then you find out later they're not criminals, they're just hipsters, because one of them has a pizza tattoo, and that's, like, a hipster thing, and you're just like, oh, <laughs> like, it's just kind of funny. Is, yeah. Is that a hipster thing? See, yeah, I felt I was very disconnected with youth culture, and I wasn't sure <laughs> how is. much of this was. <laughs> yeah, there, there was there was this... um. Uh, this old blog called look at this effing hipster and there was like a whole section of just pizza tattoos and um, okay like i think it kind of like comes from that oh and then there was like look at this effing love connection and it was a man hipster and a woman hipster who had matching pizza tattoos and then found each other so yay <laughs> yeah so like it just made me think of that um but to what gerald was saying so I also really like this story. And it was one of those things where, like, when I first read it the first time and I finished it, I was like, eh, okay. Yeah. Half, like, it was smart, it was clever, but, uh. and then 
I started thinking about it and then I went to sleep, which was a mistake. And I had a whole bunch yeah. of anxiety dreams that were definitely mm-hmm. told by the story. Really? And I wake up and I was like, my rating just went up because I fell asleep. And then <laughs> I read it again. Then I started thinking about it. And after an hour of taking notes, it felt like I had gone like deep diving to the bottom of this iceberg and my head hurts now from the pressure. <laughs> and it's just so much. Like, it's intense. Like, I don't think we're even going to cover everything because. I don't know if it's possible, but it's so deep. It's so just like, and different. So one thing I was also saying in the pre-show is it's really religious, which we don't tend to read. Like we've had a few sort of religious stories. Um, David Foster Wallace is good people, deals with a Christian couple dealing with abortion. There was a few of them, but they're all very obviously signposted as like, this is a religious thing, right? This Mm. one doesn't do that. And yet it's just like dripping with it. Yeah. So I, that's most of my notes. It's just like finding all of those moments. Yeah. I um I would like to go on record that I specifically told you this was not bedtime reading. You did. You did. <laughs> because I also read it before bed one night and had a plethora of anxiety dreams. <laughs> yeah. Because this story, well, we'll get to what it's about. We need to like, I think, really set up the foundation of just like what happens, the basics before we can even get to what it is. But you know, so we, Yesterday, Andy sends me a message saying, oh, did you read the story yet? And I was, I had planned to read it by the time he sent me that message, but then we had an accident with the cat and we had to take her to an animal hospital and now she's a faker and she was fine. Like, you know, uh, so I don't get home until late. I read it late when I go to bed and my gosh. <laughs> so, um, so let's just talk about, we've been saying the story can be impenetrable. So let's just start with the main character, Jane Click, what happened to and where is she now? And the where is she now is really, I think, the important part here. Because as we got from Andy's summary, retirement home, sort of, maybe? Yeah. yeah. I, I, and I think, I think the thing about it is it's not impenetrable because you don't read it and you and because that sort of turns me off sometimes. If I think this is so dense, this is so deep, I can't. I, I, but it draws you in because it's got this top layer of story and then you di- dig a little deeper and you think, oh, I found out something. But then you find <laughs> out that you haven't found out anything yet and you have to go deep. So it's that sort of draws you down. But, but it, yeah, there's lots to chew on. Yeah. So let's talk about what happens to Jane Click. So we already talked about that she lost her son and his friend. And then there's a series of things that happen, the way that people react to her and how she ends up here. So what happened to her and where is she now? I don't know if one takes that first. Yeah, I, I, I liked – I had to look up what a – columbarium was oh because I, I didn't know what it was and i because I, I thought yeah it's described as this it's um it, it, some sort of retirement place or, or maybe it's a place where people go who who have experienced trauma and have difficulty dealing with life perhaps um and uh so so it's called the dove or dove because it looks like a dove coat, but it also looks like this columbarium. And when I found out what it looks, what, what that meant, I thought, oh my word, yes, that is mm-hmm. so clever. I like that. Because mm-hmm. that's, that's where people go to yeah. die yeah. and just be put in a room forever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, you know, but like Gerald said, there's like two meanings here. There's a surface meaning that when you find out columbarium, because I also had to look it up, is a place where you store urns. Um, you're like, ah, ha, ha, where people go to die. That's a kind of common joke of retirement homes. But then later you realize it's not really a retirement home. It's a unique thing. And then you realize there's a second meaning, which is what Gerald was just sort of talking about, which is, is this a place where the residents put their grief, their painful memories to rest? Like the urn is that trauma that you're carrying with you. Um, because there's that line where it's like, they're talking about how Theodore, the gestures are lucky. And then it's like, they are all unlucky here. Decent enough individuals caught by mishaps in time. In a, of time in a circumstance of continual bearable punishment. So it's like all of them are here because of some trauma that happened to them. Yeah. There was also the, um, during their meetings, where once one person we know not who says, there's more and more stuff I'm thinking I can put into words. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And then somebody says, oh, I'll, one of the youth says, I'll challenge you to do that. And she's <laughs> like, no, because once you write it down, it's no longer yours. It doesn't belong to you anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Which, which yeah. is interesting because isn't that ultimately what Jane Click does by the end when she doesn't actually want to revisit the chapel? It's the sense of like not losing that thing that you're holding on to, not having the final answer. 
preferring not to look. Yeah, I, I, and I think it, it's something like the, the 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 thoughts and memories that you have are the way that you view something, and so the way the place was described to her is, is she's built this picture up in her mind. And she doesn't want to destroy that picture. She doesn't want to destroy it with the reality of what the place looks like. So you you can see that that she has some sort of um, a sort of comfortable feeling around around this place that they went to so many times, and and they you know they 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 spent all day there. Um, and so yeah, this not not disturbing. And so once you bring something out, it it takes form, and uh, I can see why she didn't want to do that. Mm, yeah. So uh, we keep talking about this place that you didn't want to visit. So it's Enchant, and more specifically, it's this abandoned chapel. So, like, what did the boys find there? And what did you make of that whole strange <laughs> thing? The Andy, you can. Oh, gosh. <clears throat> well. Uh, okay. I came up with, sir. I do not know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. So it's 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 animals, but not like zoo animals. Uh, and your mom's like, "Oh, is someone using it as a corral?" <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> this is click. It's yeah. not. It's not <laughs> like a corral. There's they're they're perfectly still, except sometimes they move. And <laughs> but they're not like animals you'd see. But they're animals, uh, yeah. but not statues. Yeah. 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 So, Gerald, can you? Did you get anything more from that? Does anyone talk about like sometimes it gets a bit impenetrable? Yeah, I, I, I didn't sort of understand that. I didn't. Um, I thought maybe, um, maybe they they are real animals, but they're just sort of stationary. They are just sort of, I don't know, maybe enchanted or something. But but in one of the things I, I found that someone had looked up chaunt because it's a Navajo word. And it means excrement, apparently, oh. which which is quite sort of interesting. Um, that that maybe that's that's got something something to do with it. See, we, we sort of it, as soon as you find something, it uncovers more stuff that you need to find out. And I, I sort of ran out of time to to tie that into the whole story. So I thought chant was more. It's an old spelling variation of chant. And there's a lot of allusions to old religions that have been abandoned, emptiness of religion. So you have this old spelling of chant, and chanting is usually linked to some sort of spirituality or faith, whatever it may be. So I just saw it that way, like an abandoned chapel in an abandoned town called Chant, an abandoned practice. That's is that simple. That's how I found it. But um, I don't know. It's you know. When I do my religious monologue and my brains, you're going to see smoke coming out of my ears. <laughs> I'm like holding off before getting there. But, yeah. you know, I think for me, the animals thing that I found really interesting is two things. It's how there's a, well, when I get to the, it's still already tying into the religious stuff, but it's a bit like that wonder and that feeling of, the not knowing is what makes it attractive to them. They talk over and over about how the animals are waiting. They're not waiting for us. They don't care about us, but we're invited to sit with them. We're, they're expecting something greater. Where we can sit with them to expect something greater too. Right? There's this sense of almost like a parish. Like you're waiting for some sort of revelation, for some, some sort of like enlightenment or not. And they don't care about you specifically, but you may join them, right? There was those sort of lines about like when the boys are describing how the animals are behaving, like it's like a dog who's waiting for someone and you come and they'll look at you for two seconds, but then they'll look away. <laughs> like mm. how does they describe them? Yeah. Um, which I thought was very fitting for a chapel. It made me think of the animals as being the parishioners. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I thought it, was, it might be something to do with that, that, that it is some sort of manifestation of, of some sort of religious service um, encased in time. Um, th there was something else that, that, because the danger is with, when you look in the, when you look for sort of wider help with stories, you then get some maybe strange ideas. And, and, <laughs> and so someone found out that, that Billy's friend Jerome is the name of a former mining town in Arizona, which is like a Western ghost town. Um, and you know, is that why he was called Jerome? And is that part of the 
the illusion and allusion of what she was writing well, about? Maybe. I don't think so. Andy, do you have a response to that? I haven't given you a chance. I. No? There you go. <laughs> I, am, I am responseless. Okay. <laughs> I have a theory on Jerome too. When I do my, I, mean, I, I do have a Jerome thought, mm-hmm. not a response. And also, I don't know how to connect this. Okay. But the other animal we know is the Saint Jerome and the lion, mm-hmm. <clears throat> which I don't know if you are familiar with paintings of Saint Jerome and the lion. But as the children noted, that lion looks weird. <laughs> <laughs> Right, like these archaic paintings of Saint Jerome and the Lion have lion with like a creepy human face, and they didn't know what a lion was, and it's super weird looking lion, and that's the only other animal in the story, is this weird looking religious lion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So maybe the animals are like Saint Jerome's lion. I mean, I have a theory on the animals too, but I want to first get to the higher level themes because it only makes sense when you talk about the higher level themes. So why don't we do that next? Like, why don't we talk about what, if we're t- looking at just the surface before we go deep, what is like the first few things that jump out at you? We can go with Andy. Well, so on the surface, <clears throat> right, the, it's about, you know, grief. And the neat thing I thought is that they threw out that this Theodore guy is a teleologist. Mm -hmm. right so he's there he's oh no look things should have functions and purposes let's explore how things are useful um but clearly in the dove that is not the setting where anyone wants to be functional or purposeful Mm -hmm. and and then he's wearing a jester motley for some reason right i love that you brought that up okay not only is the jester guy that no one takes seriously a teleologist who's trying to find the purpose of things, the functions of things, not, and if you look, if you, like I looked up Wikipedia, if it's a purpose that humans are imbuing on something, that's not the true purpose. You got to find the true purpose in a natural setting, right? But the woman who describes what a teleologist is says it's thinking about beliefs. She's confusing it with theology. There's a confusion <laughs> between teleology and theology. She doesn't get it right. She gets it wrong. She makes it about beliefs and beliefs. Theology is almost the opposite. We sometimes mistakenly try to find a purpose to faith or grace when there doesn't need to be. The wonder is sort of the point. The faith that there is some answer even if you don't know what it is, right? So that confusion at the end between teleology and theology was like, I knew it. This is all religious. <laughs> like, <ooh. laughs> That was my deep dive spelunking. I get to that part and I was like, ha. But that's the surface level themes before I do my religious thing. Because I'm like, so gerald so uh grief death anything else in there or any other versions of death or that you noticed um on the top level no no it was it was just those two um Mm -hmm. and uh and and also theodore is is that name been chosen particularly because of theology and yeah. theology and and that sort of confusion so that's that's a sort of interesting thing um, Ooh, i didn't even think of that yeah his name mm, maybe yeah. maybe all right going in so yes grief yes okay. death, but it's the death of the sons well the son and his friend herself religion and the planet there's little environmental yeah. messages in yeah here too, there's right go ahead I, yeah. well i was gonna say i didn't want to bring it up at any particular point in the summary of the plot but is it like is this a stealth dystopia they're just kind of sliding like there's abandoned towns and hey the youth is going to have to deal with this mess not us but that's where we are now there are abandoned towns towns. there's Mm. seven billion people all those comments she makes is now there's people with pizza tattoos i would I would submit that we are in a stealth dystopia. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and, and the water thing as well. That that um, you know, yeah. she, she talks about the clouds, but no rain came, and the water's all evaporating. Yes. yes, yes, yes. Okay, if you look at it as environmentalism, end of the planet, the the death and the ex- because there's also a reference to extinctions, right? Ex- which I'll get into. 
plus the animals, there's a Noah's Ark thing here, right? Okay, hold on. Let me get through this. Ooh, like my boom moment. What? Boom. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Chant, the old spelling of Chant, we talked about. There's an empty chapel. The animals are waiting, and it sort of made me think, when you have a lot of animals and you got some biblical references, if you don't think Noah's Ark to even try it out, you're making a mistake. Let's see mm -hmm. if it's right. So, um, that's a biblical catastrophe. That is a, a mass extinction that's coming. Uh, and then the, the chosen pairs are the ones who survive. Here you have a pair of boys who don't survive. You have rains that are not coming. It's very bleak. Like these animals um... are not be saved by a flood. These, these, the pair of boys, they die. And, um, and there's a way in which when, the, when uh, Jane Click says, oh, you know, St. Jerome, and they see it, he rejects it. He doesn't like that. He doesn't like the idea of St. Jerome as a genesis for his name. Uh, which is very interesting, very interesting. Um, and huh, I'm trying to get to all the other parts. Uh, so yeah, so the kids should have been the, the, the planet's rehabilitation. And there's that comment at the end where one of the ladies, I think the one who confuses theology and theology, but she never gives anyone names. Um, yeah. There's that line, I have to like flip through my millions of notes, where uh, they're talking about how, is it over here? Have so many notes. Oh yeah. Okay. She's talking about the pizza tattoo. First. So what I see is a slow and steady profaning of our species. Uh, and then speaking of the pizza tattoo people, that kind of attitude belongs out there. Uh, so let them finish the job. Theirs is a mop up operation. They never thought that would be their destiny. This idea of like the end is here. We're not even getting the biblical floods. The animals are in an empty chapel. The pair that's supposed to rehabilitate the earth is dead. Like, it's just very bleak, right? Like, that part of it is there as well. Um, and in the dreams that, uh, that Jane has, so she never visits the chapel in person, but she visits it in her night mind. She has dreams. And what happens in the dreams that occur over and over and over, she eagerly waits for judgment from something like a judge. And there's also all these comments about how... Um, when the kids get older, like a thought that she had was that soon the children will no longer realize what they understand. What they understand is that the wonder is the point because she explains they will not, no longer be at ease with wonder. They will be unable to abide it. They will eventually grow up like all the other modern people who need an answer, who need the teleology, who need to understand the purpose, who can't just accept the wonder the not knowing. And in the end, she's content with the wonder not knowing, which is why she doesn't go to the chapel. Like, that's the way that you, like, the not knowing and the embracing of the unknown and the embracing of the judgment and the embracing, like, that's where the salvation is. Like that, it just, it just, I don't know. It paired for me. I don't know if it's convincing for you guys. Mm. Um, yeah, that, that, that part that you're talking about, the, the dream when she's in the place and, and the whole way that that's written mm -hmm. is, is fascinating. So it's like she's, she's gone there to wait for the rapture or something um, that's, it was never the wrong day, the wrong hour for waiting those all days and long. Soon something would enter fearsomely abruptly. Um, but before this happened, before it could ever happen, she awoke. So mm -hmm. it's it it's it's like she's going there for, for atonement or, or something, um, and it's never going to happen. Mm -hmm. And it's the same reason she stopped reading, right? There's that line about... Um... Where is the line where she stops reading? Which I also oh, she preferred the language of displacement and estrangement that prepared a path to revelation. And she realizes that books just want to rip out your soul and make you sad. She doesn't want to read that. She only wants to read things that lead to revelations. Um, and there's that other line where she talks about, um, but those to whom man has awarded extinction surely suffer more than death, which again goes to an extinction of what? Animals, plants, earth. Her own bloodline, her kid has now been kid, uh, killed, her only son. Um, faith, uh, the, the idea of religion, there's a lot of things that you can say that man has a word extinction within the context of the story. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You just keep going, you're like, oh. it just keeps opening up. That was my whole like religious thing. Because when you connect the dots, it's like, all of a sudden, the animals is Noah's Ark type thing makes sense when you're like, oh, but it didn't rain. Oh, but the pair of boys died. And, like, there's all these other... I don't know if it's convincing or interesting. It's 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 funny. You you just mentioning that went about the books and Revelation. I I just thought, is that to do with the Bible, and 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 seeing the books and and you know ultimately led her to the conclusion books only wanted to expose and destroy you. 
I don't, mm, don't know. It's it's like your like your Noah's Ark thing. I think I think when when something comes to you and you think, is this about this? You have to test it out. You have to apply it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And then I did some research on Joy Williams, and she wrote an anthology called Ninety Nine Stories of God, and a whole bunch of other books that she's written have a grace faith um, uh, streak streak to them. And a lot of times, her criticism is this: it's the way that modern uh humanity has rejected the embrace of like the mystery um like it's not so much like go to church do the rites do the rituals that's not her angle it's just more stop insisting on the answer stop insisting on control that's why we're here that's why things are dying mm. Mm -hmm. i like it this, yeah yeah mm -hmm. it's a very clever story yeah <laughs> I have a um, question. Yeah. <clears throat> Since you two seem to have performed more research than I, mm -hmm. the the poem about uh, about uh, the starry pavilion, God's grace thing. Mm -hmm. Did you attempt to discern what poem that was from? No. Oh, we sh I should have. I was I, an hour of notes, and I didn't even get there. Ah, now there, well, there is. Oh, did you? I I attempted. <laughs> Okay. Perhaps you had more success. Well, um, yeah, because someone did the research, somebody on that their internet, um, and the, it's there's um, the poem is "Ode to Joy" by Friedrich Schiller, which is the you know, Beethoven's ninth thing. Um, but then there was there was, uh, and it says that that poem. And Schiller, the writer, more well, generally, was an influ influence on Dostoevsky. And so the passage comes about um, when, when Dostoevsky is talking about religious faith and belief in Jesus. And, and that's where I sort of bowed out because I thought, wow, this is, this is far too deep for me. But, but it's clearly a reference to heaven, right? Well, yeah, I think so, but but I think I think there's a deeper story. As I think there's a deeper reason why she used that. Okay. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, so uh, the research. Um, what was it suggesting that it was about, or it didn't get that far? Um. Uh, um it didn't get that far. Okay. It's, it's so just it about yeah. religious faith, and uh, in the brothers Karamazov, it's Ivan's struggle with his belief in Jesus, belief in God. So it's mm -hmm. it's that, um, and it could be something that like that that influenced her. Yeah. I would say <clears throat> the only place I was able to find that exact translation, because the Ode to Joy would have been in German. Mm. Um, but translated in that specific way, the starry pavilion, whatever it was, I don't recall exactly, mm. um, was in someone else's essay about the brothers <laughs> Karamazov. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> and I didn't, uh, I didn't know what to make of it from there. But isn't that interesting? <laughs> yeah. yeah. For beyond the stars' pavilions, God shall compensate your grief. So it, it's. That, so that there's a there's a sort of suggestion that that uh, when you die and when you ascend to heaven um, that that you know your grief will be compensated for. Yeah, it's the idea of, of heaven of, of having some sort of um, comfort after death. And who says this again? Theodore. It's mm. And no one likes it. Well, I don't know no one likes, but that everyone thinks a little crazy. The guy who's dressed as a jester, the guy who has faith that. Or beyond the stars, pavilions, God shall compensate your grief. It's Theodore again, not Elkman. Mm. <laughs> and Elkman was like a prepper, right? He was preparing who, for the end of the world. Who yes. wished he hadn't brought up the thing about the elk? He feels <laughs> silly now. <laughs> <laughs> he does. Yeah. And again, that the idea that he's like, oh, that there's security in elk, that like having that meat, you know. Um, yeah. He sounds like a bit like somebody who's preparing for the end of the world. And then there's another line with, um, there are now seven billion people. And you can't love them all is the problem. I thought that was a good line too. <laughs> Just like the idea of like the end is nigh is throughout this. 
Yeah, and, and and some people wondered whether Theodore was a Jesus character, wearing rags. Mm, I can see that argument. If you go all in on the religious reading of it, he's the one that's trying to get people to church. Yeah. To accept that there is um, uh, a better place after death. Um, and a theologist, who people think is a teleologist, but from the sound of it, theologist. <laughs> yeah. Because again, she says, what, what does she say? She says, um, exactly. It's going down. Um, and the story is it, it's not actually that long but it feels long because like it's got yeah so dense. it's got lots of stuff in it it's um, 3200 words yeah. here's a question did you guys listen to the audio of her reading it yeah i, I started yeah i started listening to it she mm -hmm. reads it well mm. so although she yeah. Super dead pants, all of what I thought yes. were jokes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she she was she was a bit bit like a, a like poets sometimes are. They just deliver the words and it's all about the words and, and you're missing the, the sort of subtext. Mm -hmm. So it's um do you know what a teleologist is? I had to look it up. It's a kind of thinking, a belief even. It sure made him go off the rails. I'm like she's confusing teleology with theology. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Very good. Ah, oh, this this book, it just it's I mean story. This story is just Yeah. It makes me want to read more of her stuff to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, I I think I think you know, may I I thought that but then I wondered whether there might be too much of the the whole sort of religion <laughs> thing. Um, I have a very low threshold for that type of thing, but, but um, such a clever, such a clever writer. I think mm. it's funny. I I I have a really high threshold and appreciation for when people come at the question of religion from purely a perspective of stop trying to control, be more grateful for life, um, be more grateful for the wonder, and it's less about the institutions of religion. When it starts to get like. People should live this way. People should live that way. That's when my tolerance goes out the window, right? That's when I'm like, nah. But when it gets like to this level of like, of what I think she's trying to say, or like one of my favorite um, comments on religion recently. So just before the holidays, Stephen Colbert did a thing where he had people come on a show and interview him. And he's very vocal about being Catholic. And they asked him like, why are you like religious, even though you see all the harm that comes from it, like you've seen, like what has gone wrong with the Catholic Church and all the abuse of boys and children. And he said that for him, it's just about gratitude for being alive. And that's it. it it's more like that's the way he sees. I'm like, that's such a good answer. Like mm. it, coming at it from that perspective, I can see how it has a valuable place in like existence. And I like that it seems for, like for Joy Williams, or at least the way that I'm interpreting this, that's really where it comes from. She doesn't need the mystery solved. She doesn't have to go to the chapel to have the wonder that was mm. by the boys who went there deadened by facts, by a broken pew, by splintered, uh, by, by a roof that's gone. Like she didn't, she, did, she didn't want that bluntness of like, here's the facts, everything's dying dead. Like I really like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Gerald, you said you did a bunch of research on her about like where she like, her, her own story as a writer that you think contributed to this? Oh, yeah, yeah, that, that she just that, um, where is that? That she is, um, sorry, uh, let me just, da, 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 da. I know, I'm um, clicking notes. And yeah, notes. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, th it's something about, something about her, her, being from Arizona or, or living in Arizona or, or something like that, that she often talks about um, climate change and religion um, yeah. as being those sort of two things. Um, so there could be some some specific local aspects to the story. Um, well, the desert. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, I can't find it, of course, now. Yeah. And I didn't get the sense that she was that old despite the picture of the New Yorker because, I mean, her kid was young. He was still fairly... Right. <clears throat> hmm. Interesting. 
Yeah. And, and there's that kind of like sad part where people are looking to blame her. Like, why did you let them go there? You know, and yeah, like there's a little bit of commentary there of how here's the grief stricken mother who lost her child, who was trying to enrich her child by letting him explore things that are wondrous to him in a very innocent, childish way. And accident happens, and people are very quick to pounce on her. Yeah, I was just like, yeah, like that, that, that is a shitty aspect of our society. But they did not want to blame or even at first say who it was. That's right. They were the protecting the surgeon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm she sure. has a very grounded view on that. She's like, he's not blameless, but also he's not guilty in the sense that he didn't do this on purpose, but he is behind it. Right. Yeah. Like she has a more like level headed view of what happened. And everybody else is like, Making excuses for the surgeon, almost. Yeah, yeah. It makes it makes you wonder that the that the police didn't want to release the name of the guy originally, and 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 then pe- the 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 parents of of Jerome were putting rubbish on her her lawn and things like that. So sort of blaming her, and and she was just pointing out that uh, yeah, he he committed the act of of killing the children, although it wasn't you know it wasn't deliberate, so he wasn't really to blame. Um, Joy Williams is 74, by the way. Mm. She's um, interesting. Yeah, yeah. But I, I did like that small commentary, and it, it, she didn't beat you over the head with it, about, mm. like, just, yeah, the how unjust it is. Accidents, so what, little boys shouldn't, you know, the idea of, like, you can't have kids who just go out on bikes anymore and have a good time and what happen to them is on you. It's like accidents happen, and that doesn't make this pain any less intense, but let's say those kids hadn't died, in what ways would their lives have been enriched by that experience, by that bond that they shared, by those things that they discovered, right? Mm. Um, And also, even your highly protected children who you don't let bike to the next town over on their own can die of an accident. So (laughs) just saying, like, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Very unfair. (sighs) Yep. Ah, oh, there's just so yeah. many layers. I think yeah. I think we've done it a fair amount of justice. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think so. I think we've touched on 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 the points and and expanded from from external sources too. So yeah, it's, wow. Well, <clears throat> here's a very important question dwelling on my mind, and and Ais, you seem to be aware of hipster culture more so than I. Mm-hmm. Do people really shave their eyebrows off? Probably. I mean, that's not as common. I think that's just like body modification people, but body mod people do. That's not hipster, that's body mod. It's a different subculture. Okay, good. Yeah. Queen, <laughs> queen of the subcultures. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Hipsters don't really shave eyebrows. <laughs> okay. Okay, so... Oh, just one last thing. So we do we all like the pros? Or was it were you at any point sort of frustrated by how eccentric it is? No. 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 Yeah, I think the, the writing was what kept me going through some of the weird elements of the story. Mm. Yeah. Especially because I think when you're talking about serious themes that have to do with like death grief, religion, the end of the, the extinction of the human race and the planet. If you take yourself too seriously, you can come off as just a scold or just, it, you can, it's very easy when you're dealing with these subjects to have a tone that just makes it not fun to read at all. Mm-hmm. It's kept it fun. Yeah. yeah. When it shouldn't be because, <laughs> my God. Yeah. 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 I want to read her 99 stories of God to confirm my suspicion that it's just more like, yeah, like her sort of spiritual take on this. Yeah, Um, that would be interesting. mm -hmm. Yeah. And I do like when people reference religion sometimes because it harkens back to how we got here. Like, even if we have grown more secular and we may not feel that we need faith or spirituality as much, and I'm certainly in that camp, like I don't actually think about it that much. But I'm very aware of the fact that the way that I am shaped, my culture, my society, how I am here, was by thousands and thousands of years of deeply ingrained religion in the everyday lives and moments of people, and that I've been shaped by that, even if I myself have not been very religious throughout my life. 
Like that's something like I always think about, like if I have kids, I'd probably drag them to church a few times just to learn about this. They don't have to be religious. They don't have to do any of the rites and rituals, but know about this because this is an important part of like your ancestry and the story of like man, you know, like I, I, that, yeah, I always find that interesting. Maybe I'd probably love a theology class. And, and, and also I think, I think that it's, it's still very, very important for, for so many people around the world and, and, and particularly in, in Western uh, Western countries, uh, you know, pe people live and die by by the religion. So, so I think it's important to give children uh, an appreciation of what religion yeah. is, what it, you know, how what it looks like, and and what the purpose of it is, if you can, uh, mm -hmm. and, and let them make their own minds up. Yeah, yeah. And I'm a big believer in some people need Jesus. Like, there's some people who just to function in their lives need Jesus and mm. expect that, go for it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I love those memes where it's like when you see someone doing something just completely immoral or petty or out of whack, and it's somebody always comments like, you need more Jesus in your life. Like, this is some of my favorite memes. <laughs> Very good. It's like a reset. <laughs> <sighs> okay. Yeah. Anything else? Or are we good to rate? I think. Yeah, I think we're probably good to go. I, okay. I feel like there's more to be said, though. That's the thing. <clears throat> Nothing I know what to say. Yeah. But just there's there's more going on yeah. in this story that I can't pick out. Yeah, exactly. The, the, like, I, like I said in the pre-show as well, after I sat here for an hour, wrote three pages of notes by hand, I stepped out of like the office and I was like, my boyfriend... This is for smart people. <laughs> it's, I think it's a sort of story that you could get a group of like 20 people around in the circle and, and have them read it several times, like 10 times or something, and then come to the group and, and tell us what you think it's about. And, and I think that would be fascinating because people would have different ideas and different opinions and, um, and and who knows, you know, they'd probably all be wrong or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it's um, it's it's an amazing story. There's probably no right or wrong though, because she read. I didn't listen to it, but if she reads it deadpan, it's because she's not trying to lead you anywhere. No. Yep. Yeah, yeah and, I, and I get the feeling, even if even if somebody interviewed her and said, "What's it about?" She she probably wouldn't say. Yeah, but if her catalog, if like her like. Bibliography, everything she's written is as specific. Uh, yeah. After a while, we've talked about that a lot. How when you read a lot of a certain author, after a while, you're like, I know what this is about because I've read a bunch of other stories by you, and it's always about the same thing. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that happens. Uh -huh. Okay, Go so on. Um, ratings. This is probably my highest rating jump of all time from like first read through to now. Not from while we were on the show, but like from when I first read it to now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, it's, it has to be a six for me. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And when I first read it, I was like, ah, four and a half. And then I read it again, it was like, <laughs> yeah, six. I, um, I concur with six. Wow. Yeah. The story is so, like, just, Ugh, it's intense and good and entertaining. Yeah. Hey, this is two literary stories in a row that you have liked. Just saying. Yeah. Okay, to be <laughs> fair, though, this one, by chance, had s some similar aspects to the last story, which I did enjoy. And that... Wow. Just a despair at the end? So yeah, despair you at gotta the end. have a despair at the end. And I feel like and I was I was actually a little dreading having to face Rami after this. Hmm. Because on the surface, it's certainly another story <laughs> where they have an opportunity to do something and choose no, wow. not that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I will prefer nothing. I, I choose okay. death. Okay. All right. Look, plot structure wise, I'll give it to you that the stories are similar. <laughs> you could do something and you choose not to do something. But themes wise, they're nothing alike. Prose wise, well, nothing alike. Yeah, this had many more jokes, which is a <laughs> I feel like it's a great way to, to tell a story about despair. Lots yeah. of little funny asides and a pizza head. <laughs> yeah. Pizza. Okay. So we're sixes across the board. 
Yeah. And uh, this week we don't have a game because next week we have a guest, uh, Ali Hafkosik. She's the author of the SSR podcast. It's another bookish podcast. What she does is very interesting. She revisits uh, books that she loved as a child to see if they hold up as an adult, which I think is great. I'm going to be appearing on her show as well in February. Um, we're going to do a, I know what you did last summer, so that's fun. But she suggested that we read next week Omakase by Wike Wang. I hope I said that right. So I'm excited to read that. Um, but before you go read Omakase, leave your worries behind and join a colony of literary lovers at, face, at our Facebook group, the Louis Roadhouse Readers, or Twitter, our Lid Roadhouse, or our website, LouisRoadhouse.com. You can leave comments anywhere. Do you want more inscrutable texts? Well, we've been reading Milkman by Anna Burns for the Literary Roadhouse Book Club, where we discuss a novel each month. Our discussion of Milkman posts this Friday, February 1st. Lastly, we spent all our money on a community of eccentric book lovers out of the desert. So support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash literary roadhouse. Every bit helps. And as always, share this podcast with the modern day gesture, offering you rise to your former traumas. Until next time, read a good story. 